So we had a shooting, and I'm not going to talk about the specifics of the shooting. Shootings happen a lot. Thousands of people every year die from gun violence in the United States. Um, and what I'm more interested in, and what I think a philosopher should be more interested in, is the ideology that's running in the background of the conversations that we have about guns and freedom and individuality and states' rights and federalism and the power of the federal government and our history as a frontier nation, et cetera. And I want to talk about just one specific conversation that a lot of people have been having recently People who are more in favor of individuals' rights to own firearms have uh, decided to focus on a specific issue, the issue of mental health. The, the narrative, the ideology, the story is that people who are struggling with their mental health should not have access to firearms. And when bad things happen with firearms, we can point to as at least one of the causes people's mental health. Now, of course, that's not the only cause. If people who are struggling with their mental health don't have guns, then they're not going to commit gun violence. But that's the narrative. Now, whenever we're analyzing something, we should ask these four questions. The first and the least interesting is what's true and false here? So in terms of the claim that mental health struggles and gun violence are connected, that claim is true, but not in the way that the proponents of that claim want it to be true. If you're struggling with your mental health, you are much more likely to shoot someone than people who are not struggling with their mental health, but the person who you're much more likely to shoot is yourself. People who are struggling with their mental health are, in fact, much less likely than people who are not struggling with their mental health to shoot somebody else. So, yeah, the ideology doesn't work in terms of truth and falsity, but ideologies aren't powerful because of truth and falsity. They're powerful because they give meaning to a situation, because they connect people together, because they reveal things and hide other things. Second question we want to ask ourselves is, what's the ideology that's present here? We've talked about this. The ideology that's present is that there is this connection between mental health and gun violence. Three, what is revealed or hidden by the ideology? What is hidden specifically here is the relationship between other ideologies and gun violence, ideologies concerning freedom, ideologies concerning anger, ideologies concerning individuality, ideologies consider, uh, concerning what Americans take themselves to be. There's a large population of gun-owning Americans for whom no statistics about gun violence are relevant. It doesn't matter if guns kill 10 million people a year. That's not the issue. The issue is that guns are part of their life. Their life is this individualist, free American life. And so uh, their right to own a gun can't be overridden by dead people. And similarly, there are people on the other side. No statistics about gun violence are going to change their minds either because they think people should not have a right to own guns. They think owning a gun is maybe usurping the power of the state or taking into your own hands what the police should be doing or other things. So what's hidden in this mental health ideology is all of the other ideological factors that are at play in gun violence. What's revealed is oftentimes things about the promulgators, the people who put forward the ideology of uh, the connection between gun violence and mental health. Presumably things about wanting to have more control over people who are struggling with their mental health. Thinking the people who are struggling with their mental health are less autonomous or less fully human than people who aren't thinking the people who are struggling with their mental health are broken in a way that makes them unable to participate in national, um, 
national rights or national duties like gun ownership? And who benefits or who suffers from the ideology? Well, people with mental health issues, struggles, suffer from that ideology, especially because the ideology contains a factually false and easily disprovable claim. Who benefits? The people who make money or who get power from guns not being restricted. Or the people whose rights are not infringed upon if it is an actual right to individually own a firearm. They are benefited. Or Whichever political party is on the correct side of the issue going into the midterm elections in 2018, they'll benefit. And Democrats have pretty much uh, ceded this entire issue to Republicans. Republicans won this one. Um, and they won because the NRA has been uh, hugely successful. They are, by all measures, the most successful lobbying group in the United States. So we see who benefits. And now asking those questions is not saying uh, anything's wrong here. It's making clear to us what's going on in the background. And we can't even have a discussion about gun ownership and gun violence until we understand what the, the playing field is. It's like asking you uh, who, which team is doing better and not telling you what sport they're playing. Well, if they're playing football and uh, they're kicking the ball around, one team is kicking the ball around, that team is not doing well. If they're playing soccer and one team keeps picking the ball up and crashing into everybody else, that team is not doing very well. So I want to encourage you, uh, and it's difficult because these are issues that uh, affect us emotionally and we want to yell and we want to uh, oftentimes rightly call the other side either uh, supporters of murder or people who want to infringe upon the individual rights of United States citizens. But insofar as we're in an analytical mode and we want to try to understand rather than just battle, and there's nothing wrong with battle. Battle is awesome and sometimes battle is required. Uh, but insofar as we want to understand, and usually understanding is a precursor to battle, we need to ask ourselves, what's going on here in terms of the structure of the discussion? How can we make sense of it? How can we analyze it? How can we make meaning from this in a way that gives us some insight into what's going on here? 